Yeah? yeah? Right? Yes. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. module for that? There, of course there is. In any case, this is somehow the live version of the Acquia podcast. Good morning, Larry Garfield, a.k.a. Krell. How are you today? I'm good, a.k.a. doing well. <laughs> Great to hear it. For, you know, people who don't know you, uh, we need to establish, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whether you've got any credibility at all, Mr. Garfield. Can you tell us, Larry Garfield, what is your first Drupal memory? First Drupal memory. Um, hmm. So this is not my first Drupal memory, but it's one of my early Drupal memories. So I I started with Drupal in 4.6, and you know was building a client site uh, in Drupal 4.6, and realized, you know, I why does theme table not support captions? Ta captions are part of tables. So, okay, I, I know I need captions for this thing I'm working on because I've got multiple tables on a page. So I should probably do the good open source thing and submit that back. Um, so I, my first patch against Drupal core uh, was adding caption support to theme table and what became Drupal 4.7. And I'll say, this is something that Drupal culturally does very well. Uh, Post of the patch, there's a little bit of discussion. Um, the initial patch did eventually get committed as is without any follow-ups, which is amazing, and especially these days. How but, many times has that happened to you in total ever? Uh, less than 10. <laughs> but I, I still remember um, Dries uh, in when he committed the patch. This is something he almost always does. He says, thank you. You know, I just committed this patch to head or whatever. Thanks. And... Yeah, okay, I'm just a random newbie dealing with Drupal, and here's the project lead saying thank you to me. And yeah, I, I, it sounds corny, but I still remember that felt freaking awesome. Just the, the extra little thank you there. Um, you know, I go, that's like, okay, it was a good call to hang around with these people. That is a, that is a, nice, that is a nice first memory. Thanks for, thanks for that. So compare the glory of that was Drupal 4.6 to Drupal now. Um, I think we managed to save the ashtray, but not by much. And that's before we even get to Drupal 8. Uh, you know, Drupal 8 certainly has a huge number of changes, but that's hardly new for Drupal. I mean, if you looked at Drupal 4.6 compared to Drupal 7, you would barely recognize it. Um, you know, it still has hooks, and it still has things called nodes, and that's about as much as you can say that's consistent between the two. So, you know, even before getting into Drupal 8, change is nothing new for Drupal. So, so tell us what is your favorite thing about Drupal? Favorite thing about Drupal? Hmm. I'd have to say... As much as the balance between framework-y type think and application type think is gross and muddy and inconsistent and results in a lot of debates, it does actually mean I can do an awful lot with Drupal uh, and still skip over certain pieces I just don't want to have to deal with. Data storage, I just don't think about. And then I can go write application stuff on top of it. So that you know, ugly as it is at times, that flexibility to work in a broader range of projects with a common platform is quite nice. And, you know, that, we get a statement at Palantir where I work at one point that we were Drupal myopic. We used to be a shop that looked at, you know, or used anything that, you know, client wanted. So, you know, we had our own in-house CMS. We had, uh, we worked with Collage from uh, Serena, um, some custom code, you know, we would do whatever. And we eventually came to the conclusion that we're better off just going straight Drupal. 
because Drupal may not be the ideal solution for every problem, but it is a viable solution more often than not. And that allows us to you know, really dig in and become experts in one system and still be able to touch you know, 80% of the possible use cases. There are still cases where you don't want to be using Drupal, but um, Drupal can cover an awful lot of bases. So I want to bring in our very patient, my very patient second guest today, uh, Chris Vanderwater. Thanks for staying on mute all this time. So I'd really like to get your perspectives on um, the architectural changes in Drupal 8. I've been following you a bit online, and I think that you're in a really, really nice place to explain um, a bunch of this stuff to us. First of all, let's go through your Drupal credibility quickly. Um, OK. Uh, so Larry, I don't even know what your title is, but you are at Palantir in Chicago. Chris, you work for Commerce Guys. And what is your title? Lead developer or, or something along those lines. OK. So what is your first Drupal memory? My first Drupal memory. <laughs> um, so, so I've had a bit of a paradigm shift over the years. Uh, understand that when when I came to Drupal, I was primarily a front ender, and uh, I've I've kind of shifted into a, a lot more programming uh, during that period of time. Uh, so, you know, I, I really my first Drupal memory um, is is the first Drupal project that I, I did, and I just remember um, this was four six. This was the very tail end of four six that I joined the community, and um, <laughs> Larry just moved off screen. <laughs> um, and I just remember it being really really themable uh, compared with I mean gosh I was coming from post nuke and PHP nuke at the time and our own internal um, ASP system that I hated with a passion. Um, uh, this was pre-commerce guys, obviously. Um, and, you know, we, uh, <coughs> we had uh, a really detailed uh, mock-up from a theme perspective, and we ended up implementing everything we had intended on doing and more with it uh, because, you know, I mean... Despite despite all the hatred for PHP template out there, it was quite capable. Um, so you know, we we implemented everything we wanted to do and more, and that was like it's Drupal's ability to to visually um, represent what we wanted to do uh, completely sold us on it. We weren't even all that worried about the content management features of it. Um, so that's that's really my first big Drupal memory. Um, so you're probably. My, you're the first person who's ever told me, oh, we went with Drupal 4.6 because it was ultra themable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, compared with its competitors of the day, uh, I mean, it, it was. It was very themable. Um, my, my second memory is also worth mentioning uh, because it's, a, it's DrupalCon Boston, and it's standing around in a circle with, I believe, Larry and uh, Earl Miles and... Um, and uh, uh, Karen Stevenson discussing... Drupal 6 stuff, I think, and getting views into core, and, you know, we've come full circle, and, and those sorts of things are actually happening now, so. Compare Drupal when you, you know, Drupal 4.6 to, to Drupal now. So I, uh, I was talking with uh, Ryan Zrama, who's the guy who built the vast majority of Drupal Commerce, um, and just kind of showing him some of the things that we had done in Drupal 8. And, you know, he made a comment. Uh, he said... Uh, wow, you know, the difference between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 is greater than the difference between, like, Drupal 4.7 and Drupal 7. And, um, you know, I totally agree with that. In fact, I, I think I, I think it was Chix who I said, I said that exact same thing within his hearing, and he came back with, you know, the difference between Drupal 4.0 and Drupal 7.0 is less than the difference between 7 and 8. But, you know, I mean, just, like, having that thrown out, I, I, really, I really stopped and was like, wow, that's... You know, that's something, right? Because, like Larry said earlier, you know, Drupal 7 even is still kind of a, a PHP 4-style system. I mean, hooks are really, like, um, an answer to we don't have objects, right? Like, to a certain degree, that's what they do. Okay, so this is actually the perfect stepping-off point into the serious <clears throat> side of today's conversation. 
there's a huge difference between the way we've been doing things and the way we will be doing things. And some people are feeling some pain. Some people are getting really excited. Uh, and I happen to know that you've gone through this learning curve and you're now among the people um, who are getting excited about it. And you wrote a post uh, recently called A Drupaler in Symphony Land uh, where you basically said, you know, I, I really struggled to wrap my head around this stuff, but now that I'm there, it's so exciting. And you posted some uh, some broad descriptions of what all these things are. So can you talk about that journey? Okay. Uh, so what, one of the things with that that I think is really worth mentioning, you know, is that um, a huge portion of especially the routing stuff that, that I go into um, on that blog post um, are things that... Um, well, as one of the initiative owners for Drupal 8, I had been doing an awful lot of work um, within uh, Drupal 8 without having to wrap my head around uh, what what work had gone into um, Whiskey, right, Larry's initiative. Um, but every time I touched it, like, there were a million different moving pieces, and it really, it was intimidating, and it gave me, you know, a, a very big, like, fear factor there. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is, this is the same old, same old. This is FUD, but it was all, like, within me. And I gave Larry an awful hard time about a lot of this stuff. Um, and, you know, uh, and, and to a certain extent, rightly so, right? That's not to say that, like, that it wasn't justified to a certain degree. Things changed drastically. So, of course, like, I needed to get in and work through it. And, um, and uh, Fabian Potentier, who wrote um, a huge portion of Symphony, um, and is the, the, I mean, he's their Dries, essentially. He's got a 12-part series, which I linked to in that blog post, um, of kind of a how-to on walking through a, a pretty good number of the components that we end up using within Drupal, um, and ultimately helps you, like, build your own routing layer and, and this sort of stuff. And uh, I, I took some of the things that we had introduced into Drupal 8, and I pulled them out of Drupal, and I just dropped them into this repository with some Symfony components, and started just kind of trying to compose it all together into a cohesive whole to help me understand what it was that was sitting inside of Drupal. Now, I haven't made it through the entire routing um, layer yet, at least not the entirety of the routing layer that exists in Drupal, because as Larry mentioned earlier, we've adopted some components from Symfony CMF, and I haven't gotten to really dig into those yet, but I've made it through most of Symfony's um, raw components for this, and like the results, at least to me, um, were really exciting, because once I understood all the stuff that, that sat there, um, you know, I, I didn't have to guess at a lot of the words that were coming out of Larry's mouth anymore. Um, <laughs> And, and that was that was really beneficial, right? Um, so it was like uh, we're we're talking about exception handling and you know catching certain exceptions and you know I know based upon some of the work that I've done with Symphony that Symphony throws a very specific grouping of exceptions that are for HTTP stuff so that you can get certain um, response codes in certain exception situations and you know there was a whole conversation about that yesterday and I couldn't have had that conversation before I walked through this and did it and what was even more exciting to me was that <clears throat> like Drupal um, implements a couple of, of really specific Symphony uh, provided classes that are designed to help with the whole routing process um, but there's an entire an entire um, event system, which is kind of analogous to our hook system sitting there, uh, that expects responses before that stuff ever happens. So if you wanted to respond earlier, you could layer your own routing system in front of Drupal's and respond much earlier, which opens up the ability to do all sorts of interesting things. I mean, you think of it in terms of Drupal 9 or um, a completely separate, like, uh, forum application or a completely separate project management application or you want to build a Git repository system or I mean like you name it all of a sudden you have this place where you could technically build your own Symphony and Composer-esque framework and hook it straight into Drupal uh, without Drupal ever being the wiser or actually needing to manage it at all because you would have complete control over the routing that happens there but you still have access to the entirety of Drupal's stack. So if you wanted to build render arrays and drop that through Drupal render at the end of the day, you'd be completely free to do so. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. You can leverage Drupal's tools that are sitting there, and you can go off and build in your own sandbox and only cross over where it really needs to. 
And this isn't necessarily something that we should be adopting a lot in Drupal 8, but it excites me an awful lot for um, for people who have already built something in Symfony and they like stuff that Drupal does and they want to start leveraging it, but you know, how do we how do we mix those two things together? Well, you know, the Whiskey Initiative made that totally possible. Um, and so I, I, you know, I have huge, huge kudos to the Whiskey Initiative, and I think that they've really succeeded um, massively in a lot of ways that most people don't understand yet. And I tried to highlight that with my blog. Yay. I, thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, Chris Vanderwater from Commerce Guys. Thank you, Larry Garfield from Palantir. Thank you, audience. My contact information is jam at aquia.com, J-A-M at aquia.com. Chris, how can people find you online? At EclipseGC on Twitter. Larry? Uh, I blog occasionally at garfieldtech.com and uh, at palantir.net. I am Krell, C-R-E-L-L, on Twitter, in IRC, and on Drupal.org. And another shameless plug, please do follow the uh, Palantir Twitter feed and or a website. Yeah, and I, um, I, I'm a fan of the Palantir newsletter, so sign up for that, too. Um, and awesome. just to keep things simple, um, my Twitter handle is at HornCologne. Take care, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. So, a guy called Gabor Hoichi I think has I got some... Who? <laughs> what, what reality chooses to do is obviously completely different. And, you know... <laughs> and that's reality's choice. And that's yeah. reality's choice. We have no control over reality. Um, uh, Culture we... defines what truth is. Truth, unfortunately, is unaware of this. Yeah. <laughs>